Hi everyone, Ricky Rathor here again, broker owner at Remax Metropolis, real estate lawyer at Rathor Bank Professional Corporation. Today I've got Omer from The Six Mortgages um, live with me. We're recording this session to get you guys some information. Uh, Omer, how are you today? Thanks for having me, Ricky. I really appreciate uh, you uh, bringing me on and uh, you know having me talk to uh, uh, your uh, your network, your agents. Uh, I'm doing great, you know, considering what's happening. Right, we're stuck at home, can't get a haircut, but uh, uh, we're still working at full capacity, just like you guys are, just like your agents are. Uh, we are still working from home. We have the infrastructure, the technology in place. Uh, we have the systems in place. Uh, banks are still working. You know, we're still supporting our clients. It's a very um, crucial time right now for many, many individuals uh, where financing is uh, is going to be key for them to be able to. Uh, survive and kind of uh, weather this storm, you know, per se, right? I agree. And, and you know, what we're finding at our end, at, at least from the real estate brokerage side, is that the people that we're servicing right now are not tire kickers. They're people that really need to be in the market because either they've sold their home and they need to buy one or they bought their home and they urgently need to sell one. So it's, it's definitely not business as usual, but I know that we're equipped with the, with the infrastructure in place like your office to be able to accommodate clients that absolutely need to be in the market right now as uh, deemed essential services. And, and I know the team's doing a great job and that our offices are working together really well to, to help clients out. Now, we've been having a lot of questions, Omer, so I thought that this would be a great opportunity to address some of those on a wide scale uh, and address the network. So one of the major questions, and, and it's, it's, it's old news now, but it's still worth uh, going over, the Bank of Canada rates have gone down. Um, but almost all, if not all at this time, major financial institutions have actually increase their rates if you're qualifying for new financing. If you're on a variable loan, your, 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 your monthly payments have probably dropped, but if you're trying to qualify for a new purchase, the people that were anticipating, hey, this is a great time for me to go out and buy a property now because money's so cheap and it's still cheap, they're finding out from their mortgage broker or their lender that, hey, you're not actually gonna qualify at those rates that the Bank of Canada has posted. Uh, in fact, your rate's gonna be significantly higher. Can you touch on that for a little bit? Absolutely. And, and Ricky, this is uh, honestly the, one of the, the, the hardest things that we have, uh, we have to do on a regular basis because we are getting phone calls every day, multiple times a day. And it's the same thing, you know, oh, we just, uh, we just read the news. Bank of Canada has cut their rates again. So in March, as you remember, Bank of Canada cut their rates uh, by one and a half percent. So if you, uh, if you already have a variable rate mortgage, um, amazing. You know, you guys did extremely well. So if you have a variable rate mortgage, be happy, hold on to that variable rate mortgage because, it, you know, in some, some instances, people are at 1.45, you know, below and one and a half percent on variable rate mortgages, right? But what's happening out there? So this is really, really crazy. At the same time as Bank of Canada is cutting their rates, we're seeing something else happen. We're seeing that uh, the banks are increasing fixed rates and they're decreasing the discounts available on variable rate mortgages. It, 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 and you know what, explaining that to a customer um, is getting you know, quite challenging these days, but it's, there's a bunch of reasons why this is happening. So I'll try to explain that. Uh, the first and foremost is that uh, Bank of Canada's overnight rate, so basically the rate that Bank of Canada is cutting right now, it only impacts variable rate mortgages and loans and line of credits it does not impact fixed rate mortgages. Fixed rate mortgages are based on, fixed rate mortgages are priced based on the bond market, right? Now, you know, you, you can come back and you can say, but Amir, bond market hasn't changed much either, right? Bond market is still down. So why are fixed rates going up when the bond market hasn't really, uh, hasn't really changed much? So the actual key to this is liquidity. So banks have actually been hit with a major liquidity crunch. And I'll tell you what's happened. Supply of cash for a bank is what dictates pricing. Pretty simple, right? Access to how much money you have to lend out, you're gonna be able to price accordingly. So what ha what's happened is that since rates have been cut so much, your, um, your, uh, your, your, your more Canadian mortgage bonds, they're not paying much. And they're, uh, they're pretty much all time low. So investors are not pouring their money into uh, your uh, Canadian mortgage bonds anymore. So that is usually the cheapest way for banks to borrow money. 
right? So when banks borrow money, they, uh, they, they look at their deposits and, and that's the cheapest way for the banks to borrow money. But when people are not putting money into the Canadian mortgage bonds, it creates a liquidity issue. Another thing that happened is that uh, during this whole COVID-19 situation, when financial institutions, um, uh, businesses and other, you know, corporate institutions, when they figured out that there could be a potential in, uh, uh, in, in the revenue streams being interrupted, guess what they all did? They started well, to leverage. Exactly. Right? They started to leverage. They started to borrow money. So that put further strain on uh, the bank's, bank's liquidity, right? So, so access to funds is what, uh, access to funds and liquidity is what really has caused your, your interest rates to start increasing a little bit. Then there's, and then that's not it, right? There's more to it. Forecasting, that's another thing. So essentially when banks price their, their mortgages and their mortgage products, they forecast, not for today obviously, they forecast three or four quarters uh, in the future. So now banks are looking at and, and they're thinking, okay, we anticipated doing 50 billion in the first quarter, you know, 70 billion in the second quarter because you're looking at spring financing and then, you know, 40 billion in the third quarter. Now they're cutting all these expectations as well because obviously business is going to be impacted a little bit, right? And they don't know by how much. Economists are saying, two different economists are going to give you two different answers. So well, the, the argument too on that point is that just like us as individuals, we're all trying to hoard our cash right now. And absolutely. So it's logical to infer and it's not, you know, it's, it's totally feasible to infer and suggest that a bank would also want to hang on to as many uh, cash reserves, as much cash reserve as possible. And, and the way to do that is to call back some of the money by making it more expensive. That's the whole point of inflation and supply and demand, right? Absolutely. Um, and I think that's exactly what makes sense. Sorry, go on. Yeah, and then, uh, so, so forecasting, like I said, is also an issue, right? Uh, where they, uh, uh, obviously, the spreads on the money has to make sense based on the volume that they, that they will be doing. So if the volume will decrease, they have to increase the spread as well. And lastly, uh, it's, it's potential loss mitigation for the banks. So banks are already safeguarding themselves, um, safeguarding themselves to any kind of future you know, income loss or future losses that they may incur. So essentially what I'm talking about is, um, could there be people that would, uh, that would not be able to make their mortgage payments. And actually it's happening right now. So your, your, your six months mortgage deferrals that uh, everybody's, uh, everybody's applying for and banks are giving out these uh, six months mortgage deferrals. It's taking, uh, it's taking cash flow away from the banks. Yes, they'll make, make up the interest in the future, so on and so forth. But what about their income today, right? So it is taking a piece of, uh, of the bank's cash flow out and away from them. Um, and also, you know, will there be houses that will go on a power of sale in the future? We don't know, but it's, uh, it's, it's loss mitigation that's being done today uh, by increasing those spreads by the bank. But number one, liquidity issue. That is exactly why rates are going up. Makes sense. And I think a lot of our listeners are going to agree to that. And what's interesting, the, the point about power of sales and such, my, my understanding, as far as I can tell you, based on my research, is that if it weren't for the mortgage deferrals, we'd be having a very different conversation today. And, you know, for all the naysayers that we had back then talking about the regulations that are imposed on mortgages in our, in our country, uh, when compared to the U.S., now you can really see why we have those checks and balances in place so that if we do see a correction, quote unquote, which we may or may not see, um, the banks aren't going to be out like some of the banks were in the U.S. And I think that's, um, that's one good takeaway here as well. Uh, because with the strength of the banks and the individuals and the parties with, you know, as we go through this whole uh, COVID situation, I think, you know, at the end of it, we'll all end up getting through it uh, one way, shape or form, but we will see um, an eventual end to this. And, and once we come out, it won't be that bad. Uh, we're hoping at this time. Yeah, no, you, 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 you're not wrong. You're not wrong. And, and I'll tell you something, you know, just like uh, uh, these mortgage payment deferrals, uh, the Canadian government has, uh, um, has done a lot, right? And they're continuing to do so. So as you know, liquidity concerns have become uh, significant for the banks. And uh, like I said, you know, investors are not putting money into mortgage bonds. So guess what? CMHC and the government uh, has stepped up and they've purchased almost $200 million in mortgage bonds, right? Just to help the, uh, the banking institutions with liquidity concerns, right? 
So hopefully this will make some, uh, some impact and, and we'll see, you know, maybe the rates settle down a little bit in the next few, uh, few weeks or maybe a month, we might see uh, the rates coming down because, um, you know, the government is helping out with this liquidity crunch at this time. But, uh, okay. yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, uh, you know, payment deferrals and, 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 and I gotta tell you something, you know, it's amazing how fast, uh, the banks adapted, uh, to the, uh, payment deferral, um, uh, to the news and, uh, to the process of payment deferrals. Right. Literally, um, these things, it takes it takes time for 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 the banks to figure out how, you know, uh, the, the platform they're going to be able to implement because uh, thousands of people, do you know, in the first week when the government announced that uh, the banks would uh, offer uh, offer the six months payment deferrals, uh, do you know, banks were getting 10,000 calls a day. Oh, yeah. 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 It's they ridiculous. don't have infrastructure for that, Ricky. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like, they still have like 50, 60 people in their call center answering those calls, right? Yeah. So people were, were upset, and rightfully so. I mean, you know, if you call the bank, you're going to be upset if you're on a hold for like four or five hours. But at the same time, you have to understand it from the bank's point of view as well, right? They're just, they're getting hit with a tremendous amount of volume of calls. They don't know what's going on. Uh, and then some people were being turned back when they were, were, when they were finally on the phone because the frontline staff didn't actually know what the process in place is for these uh, payment deferrals, right? So they were being told, okay, maybe we can't do a deferral or maybe you don't qualify for a deferral. But since then, the banks have done a phenomenal job, right? They've taken most of these uh, referral, uh, deferral, not referral, deferral applications online. It's, it's extremely easy. All you go, you go online to, you know, Scotia or uh, RBC, TD, they have COVID-19 pages uh, set up. You go there, you fill out your information. They ask you literally like three questions. Uh, you know, if uh, your, in, your income has been impacted uh, or your spouse's income has been impacted or are you staying home to take care of a sick or, uh, you know, someone who's sick or, um, you know, if you're, if you're staying home to take care of your kids, that's it. That's it. Yeah. And if you answer those questions, uh, yes to, you know, uh, to, to majority of those questions, basically, if you demonstrate that, yes, you have taken a hit in income, the bank will come back and they'll defer your payments. Yeah, yeah, it's been fantastic. Between the banks and the government and all the accommodations being met right now, it, it, it's quite impressive. It's, it's really amazing and it's really what's helping a lot of people get through this stuff right now. Um, and it, it, it's, been, it's been phenomenal. But you know what, Ricky, like when this initially happened, right, and you've probably seen it, you know, it was all over the media, it was all over the news, you know, CBC was putting up articles like, you know, oh, we tried calling in and we were denied uh, a payment deferral. And then there was another article by like um, uh, by Bloomberg or Huffington Post saying, you know, don't defer your mortgage. You know, it's uh, interest is being capitalized, blah, 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 blah. And I mean, I, I just I just don't get it. You know, it, it doesn't make any sense. Um, well, with money being the way it is right now and, and being as cheap as, as it is right now, this is really an accommodation that nobody had to make. Right. Um, so in my mind, if, if you qualify and you really need it, and that's why you're qualifying, you're, you're not just leveraging the government programs and the bank programs right now. Like, uh, some people are suggesting, you know, if you've got the capacity to carry it, arguably you should be carrying it. But if you can't, for whatever reason, this is something that you can tap into so that you don't end up in a really, you know, bad situation where you have to decide, should I make my mortgage payment or buy groceries for the family? And I think that's what it's designed to protect, right? It's really designed to ensure that. We all get through this together. It's an accommodation more than anything that wasn't required, but but we're seeing these accommodations because without them, a lot of people would end up in a really bad situation right now. And I don't think the Canadian government would allow that to happen. I think uh, yeah. the federal government will pour hundreds of thousands of dollars into our, our banking system, into our real estate system. I don't think we're going to see uh, you know uh, houses going on power of sale left, right, and center. I, the, the integrity of our real estate system will stay intact for sure that's right i agree and with immigration and everything else like i mean things are on hold now with everything that's happening but you know once we're back to business as usual like we're a world-class country world-class city uh and people will continue to flock you know it's it's like uh, i remember there was an article i read years ago now where david suzuki said that we're sucking human capital from the rest of the world to yep. the point where we had in downtown toronto uber drivers that were certified doctors in other countries yeah Right, and so with the caliber of the of the individual that's entering into the proper uh, into the province, we've got people that bring money. 
are, are coming in and opening up businesses, they're marrying Canadians, they're educated, or they've, they've just got a lot of money that they're going to pour into the economy. Uh, so with all of that happening, uh, and once we're back to business as usual, I, I foresee things to stabilize and continue out. I don't see a, a correction. There might be some small corrections here and there, depending on where your property is situated. But my advice to, to most of the clients at this time that are calling me in the office, my, my advice has been pretty consistent. If you absolutely need to be in the market right now because you purchased something and you need to sell or vice versa, then you got to do what you got to do. But ultimately, as long as you're not trying to flip papers or purchase assignments to make a quick profit in six months to a year, like many people have attempted, um, as long as this is going to be your family home for the next five to 10 years, you should come out uh, better than you would have been if you were renting or not owning or, or using one of the other methods in that regard. So as long as it's going to be your family home and it's going to be a home for at least five to 10 years, between the principal and even morbid appreciation, if we had uh, such a thing during that time after all of this, you'd still be on the up coming out of it 100 percent. yeah no i absolutely agree with you and you know the funny thing is i'm getting a lot of people asking like are we seeing purchases happen absolutely we're still working on purchases we're still there's still people buying yeah. activity is still happening yeah. um you know uh, obviously it's not at the same scale as you know usually like year over year but it's understandable right i mean we're yeah. in a um, we're in a lockdown but yeah, well, our office in the beginning, you know, a lot of, a lot of, I would call them tire kickers were calling in saying that, you know, we're looking for deals. We're looking for the power of sales uh, because they had already started to smell that blood in the water, thinking that it was going to become a serious issue. And then, you know, we, we had the mortgage deferrals and all the different programs come into play um, with, with the government incentives and programs to help people through all of this. Uh, so I think that right now, um, you know, we're, we're in a good place and, and the people that need to be in the marketplace right now are in it. And, and we've seen the agents uh, that have been out there using very creative uh, tools to, to make transactions happen in this marketplace. And it's great to see all of that uh, happen. Omer, what are your thoughts on, uh, on credit cards at this time? I've, I've heard, I, I, I don't know for sure. I didn't follow up and maybe you have some information and if not, that's fine as well. But do you see uh, interest rates on credit cards being slashed? I heard something, uh, but I haven't been able to verify that. Are, have you heard anything like that? Yeah, you know, it's interesting, right, that uh, we have the Office of Superintendent of Financial Institutions that will uh, oversee mortgages and, uh, you know, real estate lending, but we don't have, uh, we don't have, a, we don't have a, a presence, uh, you know, from a government side that actually takes a look at uh, these credit cards, because that's where people are paying enormous amount of interest, right? So, uh, yes, there's been a lot of chatter about uh, interest rates being slashed on, on, on credit cards during this time. But one thing's for sure, though, right? Most major banks, if, you're, if you have credit cards with TD, RBC, Scotia, uh, they're coming out they're, um, and they're forgiving. Um, uh, well, they're giving you deferred payment options on credit cards where they're not charging you interest at all. Mm -hmm. right? So that's, that's pretty amazing. I've never seen anything like that. Uh, even on mortgages, you know, if you skip a payment, the interest portion is obviously added back to the principal. But with credit cards, they're saying that, no, we won't charge you interest for this period of time and we'll let you skip a payment. So that's pretty good. But again, though, you know, having said that, if someone needs to go into their credit card or line of credit to be able to make their, you know, mortgage payments or, or grocery bill and whatnot, they're better off just to defer their mortgage payments. Yeah, right? yeah I agree. I agree. That's good. Uh, okay, so on that point, uh, because we talked about credit cards a little bit, we're you know the later part of the show, I want to talk about um, refinancing and home equity line of credits, and and just so that we we log it for later, maybe we talk about consolidation of credit cards using refinances. But I just want to plant the seed now, so we can talk about it in a little bit. Absolutely. Uh, I got a question before we before we head on to the next topic here. Um, a lot of people are asking, hey, the rates are are potentially going to keep going down potentially. Mm -hmm. um, if I've got a variable rate, um, you know, a lot of clients that, that, that dealt with mortgage agents and, and realtors that were looking for advice months ago, uh, the first question was, should I go in for a fixed rate or should I go in with an open mortgage or a variable rate? And our advice at that time, for the most part, was pretty consistent that you may want to stick with a variable rate. And if rates ever go down or you see that they're going to go up, you can lock them in. Yeah. What's the advice, do you think, at this time, if there is such a thing, uh, in terms of giving advice as a blanket statement, um, would you would you say that we should wait to lock in if people are considering locking in? Because uh, I know there's people that have renewals coming up right now. So the banks are calling and saying, hey, you've got a mortgage that's renewing. 
what sort of advice might you be able to give to somebody that's considering a renewal on a five-year loan or a three-year loan right now? Should they keep it open? Should they close it, fixed or variable? Any insight on that? Yeah, no, so that's a very good question. Again, we get this a lot, right? Uh, I, I, I'm a firm believer of variable rate mortgages. I, I've always been a firm believer of variable rate mortgages. I think anyone who's been on a variable rate mortgage since 2008 has done better overall compared to the fixed side. Yes, in the last year or so, we've seen fixed rates go down uh, substantially, but if you look at our economic climate, right, COVID is one thing, but COVID is not the only thing, right? Look at what's going on in, 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 in Alberta. Look at what's going on with our uh, with our uh, with our oil sector, right? So, so if you if you if you pay attention to that, you know that there's no chance that we're gonna start seeing Bank of Canada start raising interest rates anytime soon, right? It's potentially they may even cut interest rates um, mm -hmm. in the coming months. So I definitely think it is a time to be on variable. Um, if you if you're already on variable, you're doing extremely well. If you're trying to get a new mortgage, I still think variable rate is a good option. It could potentially go down further. Uh, and then, you know, let's, let's see what happens in the market, right? Because bond yields, again, bond yields are going down as well. So, so once this liquidity crunch goes away, most likely your fixed rates are going to start coming down as well. And if you really want to kind of be risk averse and you want to lock in, lock in at that time. Don't lock in right yeah. now. You know, yeah. I think that, that's the key takeaway. A lot of people don't realize that most mortgages, you can lock it in. If you're, if you're on a variable, you always have the option to lock it in. There's um, no and I think that's really important. Yeah, there's no penalty to lock in a variable rate mortgage. You can lock in at any time. Um, and the best part, Ricky, is that variable rate mortgages generally have a three month interest penalty. So, you know, you can even change lenders if you, worst case scenario, right? Like if another lender is offering a way better fixed rate, yeah, you can go over to that lender and pay three month interest penalty. It's not going to be a huge amount of money. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, the three month interest rate penalty or the IRD. Um, and, and I mean, the numbers got to make sense, but that's where the refinances really come in um, because a lot of people that need the cash flow, um, depending on how long this shakes out, that might be an opportunity if you paid down a lot of your mortgage or have seen some serious appreciation. Now you can take a small mortgage to have potentially get a larger mortgage at a really good interest rate and lock it in and then have a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars in cash reserves that you could then use and collateralize after the fact um, and, and really help you get through that but we'll get to that later that's for sure um, as far as uh, Omer a lot of uh, I've had some clients not too many but I've had a couple so I think it's worth addressing um, if you're on a fixed mortgage now is there any logic from a mortgage agent's perspective in breaking that mortgage and then transferring it to a variable or refinancing it for that purpose? Do you see any merit to that or is it just causing additional legal and paperwork and unnecessary hassle at a time right now where it, it may not be merited? Yeah, you know, that's, uh, th th that's a good question because we've actually uh, got a lot of people asking about that, you know, obviously when Bank of Canada has been slashing uh, the overnight rate, prime rate is going down. So people call in and they ask about, you know, hey, I'm on a fixed rate mortgage. Can I break my term and go into a variable? You know, case by case basis, Ricky, right? We have to, we have to look at what their, um, uh, what their interest rate differential penalty will be, right? Banks, if you go and talk to the bank um, and ask them if you can explain how an IRD works, right? Mm -hmm. They'll never be able to do that. They'll never <laughs> be able to explain how an IRD calculation works. So in my, in my experience, uh, you can estimate an IRD by calculating, you know, three and a half percent of the mortgage balance. Generally, that's what your IRD will come in at. You know, how does an IRD work? It's, 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 it's actually fairly simple, the logic behind it. The numbers, unfortunately, are crazy, right? So the way it works is, you know, you take a five-year mortgage today, right? Today, you took a five-year mortgage. Bank is going to borrow money from let's say the bond market for five years. So you're in contract with the bank for five years, the bank is in contract with the market for five years, right? Two years into your five-year term, you come back and you say, hey, Mr. Bank, I don't want your money anymore. Take it back. The bank is gonna be like, okay, well, we're still in a contract for another three years. So they're gonna take that money and they're going to lend that money out to someone else on a three-year term. So what's important here is, what interest rate did they charge you? So let's say, let's say they charged you 2.99. And a three-year term, maybe it's paying 2.5. So the bank is now losing half a percent. So the bank will collect that half a percent 
over three years, that remaining term from your client, right? But how do they calculate that percentage? That's where it all messes up because banks have posted rates and then they have discounts. So the way they calculate that number is it's, it's impossible. You'll never be able to, uh, to work out that math, right? Mm -hmm. So the only thing you can do is you can contact your broker, you can contact your bank and you can find out what would be my penalty be today? So the number that you're actually looking at is, will your penalty today, uh, will, you know, will your penalty today be enough um, or, or your savings on the variable rate mortgage over the term, will that be enough to cover that penalty? Because if it's not, then this whole transaction doesn't make sense. You might as well stay in that fixed rate mortgage and just, you know, roll out that term complete it. Right. Yeah. I think, I think it really, it, you're right. It really comes down to the packaging because if, if I was going to do something like that, I would obviously take out a larger loan, get a better rate. And then any credit card debt that I had at, you know, 19 or 23%, whatever the interest rate is, pay all of that off. So then in the grand scheme of the calculation, not only are you saving the interest on the credit card, which is not so great for you, uh, you're also absorbing that, that, that penalty, that break cost. And in the, in, in, the, in the grand scheme of things, it might make more sense for you to have a little bit of cash reserve that you have on hand that you've taken out of the home in terms of equity uh, to help you get through these tough times if you need that. Uh, because quite frankly, there's certain businesses like mine where um, we've had record months. January, February have, uh, and March have been record months year over year. And so even with some of the government programs outside of the loans that they're providing, they don't really enable us to be able to to take on that, you know, 70% 70, 70 wage subsidy, because year over year, we've done better. And so businesses like mine, uh, in the real estate brokerage business and, and real estate agent businesses, they, we're going to be affected in June and July, because the deals that we're getting paid out on now are the deals that were written 60 to 90 days before. And, and the deals that we're supposed to get paid out for in June and July are the ones that we're not writing right now, unless it's an emergency situation, we're forced to get out for the benefit of a client. Well, that's the thing, right? Like any income that you're making today is from the work that you did three months ago, right? So in, in theory, any slowdown today, you'll find out in July, right? You know, so, so refinancing absolutely makes sense uh, if anybody's doing it. Uh, but, you know, like I said, if you're in a fixed rate mortgage, you can still do a blended rate refinance and not pay a penalty. So you stay in the fix, you're not charged a penalty, you can still take equity out. Um, so there are ways of avoiding that penalty by you know, staying with the same lender potentially, right? And just doing a blended rate refinance. That's what we're doing um, pretty much in eight out of 10 cases right now for people mm -hmm. who are on fixed rate mortgages. Uh, but refinances, uh, they've gone up by 200% at the bank level right now. So yeah. volumes for refinances, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah, we're seeing a lot of refinances at the law office now as well. Yeah. Um, it's been a huge spike in the, in the number of deals because people are taking out the equity. Uh, and, and it has been very interesting to see that in a time that we're, we're usually closing purchase and sale transactions, we're seeing more and more refinances. So let's talk about refinances, Amir, because I think that's what a lot of people are interested in right now. Um, I don't, let's say, you know, cash wise, I'm not doing that great. I don't have a lot of reserves. My, my general advice to people, and it's been very consistent over the career, over my career rather as a real estate broker, has been that you know, ownership and, and having a home in the province of Ontario and Canada is an is a incredible opportunity. Because right now, if you dispose of a principal residence, you take that tax free, meaning whatever you buy it for and you end up selling it for, that's, that's, that's your money. You're not going to lose any of that in terms of um, you know, the proceeds that'll, that'll go to the government. Whereas if it was an investment or if you're considered to be flipping and, and being in the business of buying and selling real estate, the, the, the taxes on something like that are quite stark. So my advice has been pretty consistent over my career in that if you're buying a property and you're going to own it you know, as, a, as a family home, you're going to live in it for the next five or 10 years, one, you're going to see that month over month, let's just keep the number simple. If your monthly mortgage payment is $2,000, given the rates where they are right now, 1000 would go into principal on a monthly basis, yeah. which means my loan every year, I'm paying off $12,000 in principal as time goes on. So over the course of a five-year loan, let's say $60,000 is paid off. Now, that's mortgage that I'm paying off, but on a $500,000 property, as an example, even if I see the worst case scenario with appreciation being 1%, 1%, right? 500,000 at 1% gives me another 5,000. 
So 12 plus five gives me $17,000 a year in what we call equity based on principal and appreciation, right? So over the course of my ownership of that home, as I continue to pay down the mortgage and my prices increase, I'm actually creating reserves, right? So these are my worst case scenario reserves. And so I think where I want to take the conversation now is that if, if, you're, if you've been fortunate to be able to purchase a home and you haven't been in a situation where you rented and, and you've owned a home for the last five or 10 years where you've really seen, especially in the last couple of years, property values go up so substantially year over a year where you've paid down the principal and you've seen that huge jump in appreciation, you're sitting on a home that might be worth say $800,000 now with a $300,000 mortgage, you've got $500,000 in equity. So when somebody calls my office now and says, Ricky, I can't pay my mortgage, um, you know, the deferral's not working out, whatever in an extreme situation and say, Ricky, I really need to sell. My advice and my agent's advice is pretty consistent in that, hey, before you consider that, if that's your absolute best and final and that's the only option you have, we're here to help you through that if you need to get there. But before you get there, let's try to solve the problem. You've got a cash flow problem right now. You can't carry this, but you've got a ton of equity sitting in your home. And rather than sell it and have to start again from scratch, you may be in a, in a position where you can leverage the equity in your home and refinance the property, giving you the cash flow you need, pay down all of the bad debts, i.e. the 40 or $50,000 in credit card that you might have, credit card debt that you might have, that you're carrying at 23 or 24% interest, pay all that off using the, the, the refinance, um, uh, the equity in the refinance, and let's be a little bit creative because as a, as a realtor, as a broker, my job, the way I see it, is to, is to give the clients good advice. Yes, it's commission-based position where I don't make money if I don't buy and sell, but most people overlook the fact that if I refer a client to a mortgage agent or another professional, I may be entitled to receive a totally legal and above board referral fee. So we're not supposed to be driven by the commissions that we earn. And I think that the overwhelming majority of agents are operating in the best interest of their clients. And so let's talk about this now. If somebody comes to you and says, hey, I'm not in a great situation, but I've got a paid off home. Let's talk about home equity line of credits, whether they're secured or not. Let's talk about refinancing with a major financial institution, what that might look like. And if in a worst case scenario, you can't qualify for a major financial institution, what are the B and C sides or the private sides? What do they look like? Because in my opinion, a 10% interest only mortgage is still better than having $100,000 in credit card debt at 22% or 23% interest right now. What are your thoughts on those three things? Yeah, so I mean, you know, equ uh, equity takeouts uh, for debt consolidation, uh, we've been doing these uh, for the longest time, right? This is not something new. Uh, we always uh, try to look at a client's uh, overall financial picture. Uh, you'd be surprised, Ricky, there's so many people that carry unsecured debt, uh, you know, in hundreds of thousands of dollars of range, right? Because it's so easy to get, right? Like uh, today, uh, you pay off your line of credit, they'll give you another one. Right, you pay off a credit card, they'll increase your limits. Exactly, right? It's just that's just how things are, right? And 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 you know, even though you know, Canadians are a conservative bunch of people, right? We're all conservative in terms of our spending, but still, it's very easy to kind of rack up that debt, especially if you start supplementing uh, income using credit. And that has happened. That that does happen, right? Like you'll see a lot of people who will spend. Uh, $2 for every dollar they make, you know, it's a lifestyle thing and that has to be adjusted. But let's say you have a hundred thousand, hundred thousand dollar debt in, um, in, in credit cards or line of credits, right? Your minimum payment on a hundred thousand dollar unsecured debt comes out to $3,000. That's what it comes down to. You take that same hundred thousand dollar debt and move it onto your mortgage. You know what, you know how much your payment will go up by on a mortgage? You know, based on a 30 year amortization at a 2.99% interest rate by around 400 bucks, right? Yeah. So instant cash flow relief. So if you're carrying balances right. on your- Right there, right? For the people that are listening and not able to put it together, that's $2,600 that you're not paying out now. Absolutely, that's, yeah, exactly. Instant relief to your cash flow, right? So, so, so if you have high balances on your credit cards, on your loans, on your line of credits, and you have equity in your house, 100%, you know, think about doing a refinance, take, take, take the equity out, pay out all the high interest rate debt, you know, bad debt, and, 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 and move it onto your mortgage. You know, your equity is not doing anything if it's just sitting in your house, right? So you might as well use it. You might as well use it. 
uh, your payments. Uh, and, and, and think about it this way. When you get a boost of cash flow, let's say $2,500 of, of cash flow uh, comes back into your, into your account, you can increase your mortgage payments, right? You yeah. can lump some payments on your mortgage and start, and, 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 and start paying down your mortgage faster, right? So, so it's, it's very important that you kind of sit down and have that conversation with a financial planner, a mortgage broker, or, or you know, even one of the, even a realtor, because a lot of, uh, most realtors, uh, they understand the financing aspect of, uh, um, you know, uh, of this whole transaction, right? When it comes to real estate, I think they, you, you, a lot of these realtors are even taking courses in it now, right? Well, Amir, you know, let me give you a feel-good story on that, because I think it's worth mentioning. You know, one of my own agents went to a listing presentation several months ago before any of this, and at the listing presentation, the seller had interviewed already three or four other agents from different companies. And so my agent said, you know, my agent went in for a consultation and said, well, what are you really selling the property? Why are you selling a home? Right. And the seller's response to that question was that I've got a second mortgage that the private lender will not renew. They've called it. It's a hundred thousand dollar loan. I own this $800,000 property. My agent starts asking questions. Well, what's the first mortgage on that? The first mortgage is 400,000. You've got 100,000, so 500,000, the property's worth eight. Agent turns around and says, listen, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, I could easily sell this home, but where do you go from here? You've got a family of seven people. Where are you gonna go? And what are you gonna be able to afford on a month over month basis? Not only that, but you're starting from scratch. I'll be the first and last agent to tell you that it's not in your interest to sell and list this home with me or anybody right now. What you need to do is talk to a mortgage professional who can help you refinance that property, not only pay off the first mortgage that has the higher interest rate, but pay off the second that, you know, they're charging you 13% interest on, which is interest only. And the sellers were just floored. They couldn't, they couldn't imagine that that was even an option. And that's really where it comes into, you know, I, 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 we, we tell our agents and we train them to the point that, look, we're realtors, yes, but our function, our role is to solve problems, help our clients in their best interest by connecting the professionals that can give them advice. If after going out and doing your due diligence and getting the advice, it turns out that, hey, it's not in our interest to go ahead and refinance and this and that, we're more than happy, happy to help, right? Um, so the agents that are out there listening to this, especially today, look at solving problems for your clients because there's always solutions that are outside of just buying and selling. There's always opportunities out there and for what it's worth, just plant the seed with your client, take a referral fee on a mortgage, you'll still get paid, but do what's in the best interest of your client, because especially in times like now, you need to do what's good for everybody. You, you can't make that quick buck right now. You need to do what's right for your client, right? And, and, and based on the, uh, the advice that your, your agent gave to that homeowner, right? I'm sure they're gonna probably refer 10 other people to, yeah. your, um, uh, to your agent, right? Because people appreciate that, right? People appreciate that. People appreciate good advice because uh, it's, it's hard to get that these days, Ricky, right? And I think, um, uh, you know, salespeople sometimes have, uh, they, get, they get a bad, bad rep because, uh, you know, people think that we're all about selling, selling, and selling, right? Uh, but it's, it's, it's stories like this that kind of um, shed light on that, no, you know, these are professionals, you know, who do this on a daily basis and they help out their clients and it shows by the, by the reviews and, you know, uh, and you can do that, right? You can go on uh, even uh, Remax Metropolis on Google. You can see the amount of reviews people post and, you know, people literally talk about that. So, um, so that's amazing. It's giving the right advice as opposed to making sure you have a sale. You know, that's, uh, that's the type of people that you want to work with, right? Um, so in terms of a, so in terms of a home equity line of credit, let's, let's break down the difference for the listeners today. What's the difference between a secured home equity line of credit and an unsecured line of credit? Yeah, so, so unsecured line of credit is, uh, uh, is basically given to you based on your income and your credit and your, uh, your net worth, right? The, the thing is that there, it's not secured to your house, has nothing to do with the equity. And because of that, the interest rates are higher. So interest rates on an unsecured line of credit could go anywhere from 7 to 11%. Right, most people will have an unsecured line of credit, even if they own or they don't own a uh, own a property. Now, an equity line of credit, on the other hand, <clears throat> is based on uh, the value of your house. It is secured onto the property, just like a mortgage. The difference is it's readvanceable. So, you know, with a mortgage, if we give you three hundred thousand today, it's based on an amortization schedule. So that mortgage 
uh, will be paid off in 25 or 30 years, <clears throat> you're gonna make principal and interest payments on that. But with a line of credit, with an equity line of credit, it's revolving, right? And the bank only asks for interest only payments. So it's, 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 it's good in, 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 in different sense, right? Like if you're looking to have uh, access to funds um, for different projects, right? Like maybe you want to do renos uh, to your house or maybe you want to buy a car or whatever it is, right? It's okay to put that on a uh, equity line of credit. The only thing is that you have to be cognizant of your spending habits and your repayment habits. Because if you're just continuously making interest only payments, that balance is going nowhere, right? Uh, the other thing is that a lot of people don't realize um, equity line of credits are considered demand loans by the bank, right? So what that means is that uh, depending on uh, your repayment history um, and you know, the economic outlook, the bank can go and reduce the limits or even in some cases cancel that, right? Can, it, doesn't, it doesn't happen uh, with mortgages. I mean, you know, there, yes, there are instances where a bank could send you a demand letter on a mortgage, but that's completely different, right? That's if uh, um, you know, the bank finds out that uh, you obtain the mortgage uh, by uh, by illegal means or what, whatever, right? Yeah. <clears throat> but if you have, yeah. But if you've been pay, making your mortgage payments in time, everything is good. A uh, bank will never refuse you a renewal, and they'll never, um, uh, you know, try to call back a mortgage, right? With the line of credit, you know, theoretically they could even come back and say, you know, we would like to reappraise the property based on uh, how the values in the markets are, are, fr are fluctuating, right? Has that happened in the last you know, few, few years? It hasn't, right? Even though uh, you probably remember, you know, 2017, after 2017 and 2018, we saw a little bit of a dip in the market, mm -hmm. right? So theoretically, um, you know, if, if the bank wanted to, they could have decreased line of credit, um, um, credit limits based on new property values, but they never did. So it, it, it all depends on your own particular situation. Uh, line of credits are good, uh, especially because you're only making interest only payments. So, um, uh, so cash flow wise, uh, it may be smarter to leverage on a line of credit. It will protect your cash flow. Um, so I'll give you the same kind of example uh, that I did um, for uh, the $100,000, um, uh, $100,000. So on, if, you, if you owe $100,000 on uh, credit cards or unsecured line of credits, you know, your payments are going to be about $3,000 a month. Same $100,000, if you put it onto a mortgage, your payments are going to be about $420 a month. Mm -hmm. Same $100,000, if you put it onto a equity line of credits, your payment is only going to be $200 a month, right? Yeah. But remember, that $200 is only going towards interest. That's it. Yeah. Not paying it's, a, it's, it's not a safety net if that's what, you know, a lot of people are saying, I've got this $60,000 line of credit sitting there. It might not be there next week. It might, it, it, it might, it might not be there. So you can't really rely on that. Uh, like a lot of people are, uh, especially business owners, a lot of business owners are, you know, they're talking to me and they're saying, Ricky, I've got a hundred thousand dollar line of credit. Well, that's great insofar as it's available, but it could not, you know, tomorrow it might not be there when you try to pull out of it. It could go away tomorrow. Absolutely. Right. And, um, uh, based on where our market is heading, uh, you never know. You never know. We've already started hearing chatter from economists that, uh, banks will be going in and, and reviewing, uh, these line of credit, credit portfolios. So yes, potentially these line of credits can go away, but don't fret if anything like that happens, uh, we, can still, uh, we can still look into doing refinances, we can still take, uh, take a look at taking equity out of your property. Banks are being extremely lenient right now, Ricky. Um, yeah. They're understanding that uh, you know, people may have lost their jobs, uh, they're understanding that people may be um, uh, uh, you know, uh, laid off temporarily, so they're making exceptions to things like this. Right. Uh, I was actually just talking to uh, TD the other day and TD announced that any kind of mortgage application that was approved uh, prior to uh, March 30th. Right. They will fund regardless of uh, your client getting uh, uh, your, your client being um, laid off. Laid off. Yeah. Yeah. So 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 banks are understanding the situation that people are in They're They're trying to help uh, as much as possible. Um, you know, we have, uh, we have a bunch of purchases that are actually closing in May where, uh, where the clients have indeed been laid off, right? 
but you know, banks understand that uh, the layoff is because of um, you know medical concerns, uh, and it is what it is, right? Yeah. And, you know, generally, these people will be back up and running, so they're making those exceptions. I mean, are you seeing right now? Because um, I know there was a really great product a couple of years ago. It's been probably five, six years now, uh, where you the banks were giving out a mortgage in conjunction with a line of, uh, home equity line of credit. So as you paid down the mortgage, your line of credit would continue to increase until a certain cap. Are we seeing that sort of product being available right now or it's no longer available? You know, as of right now, the product is still available, right? TD does it, Scotia does it, Scotia calls it the step, uh, you know, other banks call it their home power plan. Um, right. So every bank has that product, the home uh, you know, power plan. It's, 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 it's still there. It's, it, you know, it's, it's a great product. Uh, Scotia's, uh, Scotia's is exceptionally, uh, especially exceptionally good because they let you put that product into different portions. So for example, you have that line of credit and you've leveraged, let's say a hundred thousand dollars on that line of credit. Now you say, okay, I want to take that hundred thousand dollars and I want to lock it into a mortgage. So they'll actually let you lock that portion into a mortgage as well. And you will still have the line of credit. And they'll, you can have like different portions inside that, uh, inside that, you know, one product, right? Uh, you know, Manulife started that years ago with a Manulife one, right? So, uh, so that product is still available. Um, you know, the way it works is again, at the end of the day, the bank is going to lend up to 80% of the appraised value of your house, right? Once you know what the appraised value of your house is, uh, 80% of it. So if it's a million dollar house, the bank will give you 800,000. Now, how you want that 800,000, we can sit down and we can discuss it. You know, some people want to have it 400,000 in a mortgage, $400,000 in a line of credit, so be it. You could have 500,000 in a mortgage, $300,000 in a line of credit, so be it, right? Yeah. You can split that up with this product. It's, 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 it's great, it's fantastic. Uh, and like you said, the best part about this product is that as you pay your principal down, as you pay your mortgage down, your, as your principal goes down, your line of credit increases. So you always have access to equity, right? Um, so it, theoretically, it should eliminate the need of um, rapid refinances. But what it still can't safeguard you with is uh, uh, capital appreciation, right? Like if your house is going up by 15% year over year, um, you'll still have to uh, re-adjudicate and refinance and reappraise that property, right? Yeah, but right now, Ricky, I'm telling you, uh, you know, banks are experiencing 200% increase in, uh, in refinance applications. And it's not just because people just want equity out uh, or they want, you know, money for, uh, you know, rainy day purposes. But the reality is that people are concerned, right? Mm -hmm. People are concerned because they don't know what's, what's happening. They don't, they've never been in this situation, right? Uh, so, uh, so people being concerned, it's understandable. Right, they're concerned about will they when will they go back to work? Will you know will their job be waiting for them? You know, there's a lot of businesses uh, that were operating even before COVID happened, right at the cusp of uh, existence. You know, mm -hmm. their fixed costs were right up here, you know, and 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 you know their income was right here, and they were just barely making, uh, you know, making by. Right, what happens to those businesses? Will they will how will they be impacted? Uh, with this whole, you know, halt in revenues and, 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 and so on, right? Yes, the government is doing a lot. You know, they've announced uh, $40,000 um, interest-free loan to businesses. Uh, you know, BDC has come forward and offered uh, $100,000 uh, to businesses that you can apply for, for income disruption and so forth. So there's a lot of, a lot of programs that are coming out, but it still remains to be seen what kind of impact it has on a lot of people and a lot of their jobs. So because of this, people are concerned and they're and rightfully so, you know, they're concerned. They want to take some equity out uh, and they want to do it today. They're also concerned about what will happen with values, right? All, you know, like you said, we don't anticipate values, um, you know, going down uh, or hopefully not going down in the long run, right? Maybe in a short term, we might see a little bit of a change in values. But again, you know, people are concerned. They don't know what's going to happen. So it's, yeah. uh, it's prompting them to, to, to initiate these, uh, you know, equity line of credits and, 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 and uh, refinances. And honestly, it's not a bad time because banks are uh, uh, being very lenient uh, with their process. Uh, did you hear about the, uh, the appraisal changes that uh, the banks have put in place now? No. What's that about? 
So uh, you, traditionally, when you do an appraisal, obviously an appraisal will go into your property. They'll, they'll look at the house, they'll uh, review all the rooms, they'll take pictures, and then they'll do their, um, um, their cost analysis based on uh, you know, comparables that have sold in the area in the last six months or so, right? So now most banks are trying to do just desktop appraisals. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's their first, uh, first goal. So they do desktop appraisals where they look at other properties in the area to see if they can get that value, right? From based on other properties that were sold in the area. Uh, um, if it's not working, then mm -hmm. what they'll do is they'll do a site visit. Uh, so they'll do, uh, uh, they'll review the property from the outside and, and they won't, they still won't go inside the house. They'll ask the occupants, you know, the, the tenant or the owner from the inside to take some pictures of the property that could potentially assist them in doing appraisals. Right. right. So, so it's amazing that, uh, the, yeah. you know, banks have, uh, you know, yeah, they've, they've, they've changed their process. Banks are accepting digital signatures. They didn't before. Right. Um, so now they're accepting DocuSign. They're accepting, accepting, um, you know, Skype uh, signings with the lawyers. Uh, so, so they're, they're, they're going out of their way to uh, facilitate transactions uh, in this time, which is fantastic because, you know, otherwise we would have had, uh, um, we would have had a really hard time closing deals. Yeah. 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 So Amir, if somebody's looking at a refinance right now, what, what sort of questions would a mortgage agent be asking? Like what are the qualifiers on something like that? Sorry, what are the qualifiers on something like that? So if, if, if somebody, you know, if I come to you, Amir, and I say, okay, I need, to, I need to potentially pull out some money, I need to refinance my property, what does an ideal candidate look like? What are you going to ask me for? What kind of credit scores? What, kind, like, what do I need to know uh, if I want to even start that process? How can we make it a little bit easier for a, a, a prospect to potentially determine if they should take those steps or not? Right. So because we have access to so many different products, uh, obviously we have the A banks like Scotia, TD, RBC, all those guys, right? And then we also have the alternative lending solutions like Equitable Bank, Home Trust, uh, Canadian Western Bank. So I wouldn't pay too much attention on uh, income, uh, credit scores, and so on. Uh, first and foremost, what we need to, to, to look at is uh, if there's equity available in the property. That's the main uh, that's the main question, right? So how do we know that? Uh, really, ask your real estate agent. They're the best, the, the, they are the best people to tell you how much your house is worth. Not me, I wouldn't know. I can do math and I can tell you how much you'll get approved for, but I have no idea how much your house is worth. So leverage your you know, real estate partners. Um, your team are the best people to know how much a, a house is worth. You guys are phenomenal. Right, uh, you tell me what a house is worth before an appraiser will charge me a thousand dollars to tell me how much that house is worth. Mm -hmm. So once we know what what the property is worth, we can figure out how much we can lend that person based on their existing financing. Right. So like I said, if a house is worth a million dollars, right, we can lend them eight hundred thousand, and then we have to see how much of a mortgage do they have currently on that property. So if they have four hundred thousand owing, that means that we can still give them equity of four hundred thousand. That's step one. Once we know how much we need to give them, then we can do the qualification and we'll figure out, you know, what their income is, what their credit is. And based on their income and credit, we can, we can get them approved, you know, either at uh, your, 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 your Scotia's, TD's, RBC's, or we have, um, you know, we have viable uh, alternatives to traditional financing. Uh, with it, you know, Canadian Western Bank, um, uh, National Bank, Desjardins, right? And those guys uh, have a much easier uh, qualification guideline than your actual, your actual big five, right? So, and a lot of times um, people just approach their bank, Ricky, and the bank says, no, we can't really help you. Um, and they say, okay, so nothing can be done. Now we have to sell. But you know, you have to kind of review your options. Um, you know, funny thing is, uh, commission salespeople, you know, they get T4A income, right? Their T4A income could say $200,000 on, on their T4A, but on their notice of assessment, you know, they're writing it down to maybe $80,000, right? So when the bank looks at, your, your, looks at that particular deal, the bank says, okay, you know, we can only take income on a notice of assessment and, maybe, and we can't qualify you, but that's not true, right? Uh, we have other lenders like Equitable Bank who will take literally your T4A 
uh, income to qualify your mortgage, right? So it's a, you some other lenders as well that, that all the regulation may not apply to, like the credit union. So there's even more flexibility. Absolutely. So right. You know, it, it all comes down to having those conversations, right? And I think that's where people need to, especially now, if you're sitting at home and you've got the time, make some phone calls because you can get some really solid advice. If you go to the bank, you may not get all the answers you want. You go, you know, if you're thinking like this with binders on, you're not going to get the answers you want. But there's a lot of scope. Uh, there's a lot of potential problem solving tools that are available to you, especially in time like now. Um, Omer, in a, in a situation where, okay, you don't qualify at the bank level, you don't qualify with a credit union, there's no kind of ABC situation. Um, tell, the, tell the listeners about private loans. How does that work out? If I'm in a situation where I just need some money to come out of my home, um, my home's worth a million dollars, like you said, um, and I, I wanna take out you know, something, whatever's possible, what does a private loan look like? How does that work? Yeah, so I mean, private lending has been around for uh, for many many years. It's it's gained a lot of traction uh, since uh, you know OFC, Office of Superintendent of Financial Institutions, came in and uh, pretty much changed the mortgage landscape. So um, so what's what's happening with private mortgages is that uh, yes, they will give you pretty much whatever equity you have in the house without. Any questions, right? What are the thresholds you find on that? Because eighty percent is is an uninsured mortgage in in, in uh, with a major financial institution, but some people want to go as high as eighty five or ninety percent. Yeah, right. So, so private lenders will go up to ninety percent. They used to go up to ninety five percent. We've seen some uh, retraction there. Uh, you know, private lenders, just like any other investor, uh, they're concerned about uh, the circumstances and they want to keep some money for themselves. So you, so you may not see 95% financing at this point in time, but up to 90%, it's still available in the private world. Uh, the main thing with private financing is, Ricky, we need to uh, review the client and have a clear exit strategy for them, right? Because if I'm going to lend you money at, let's say, 7 8% uh, on the private side, there's, there has to be some sort of game plan here, right? So, and what is that game plan? We have, to, we have to figure that out with the client. Yes, you can get it. Um, you know, it's instant funding. If you need money today, you'll probably have uh, financing uh, in like two days, 48 hours, you'll have cash in your hand, right? And then these private lenders are pretty good. They, they usually charge interest only. So let's say, you know, you take uh, uh, $400,000 at 7%, uh, you know, your payment is going to be about $2,000 a month. But, you know, that's, uh, and you can even prepay that. Right. So, so, so it, it, lenders will do that when they advance the loan to the law office, they take the whole year up front. Absolutely. You, you year, you yeah. yeah. So you don't have any payments, right? So you, so you don't have any payments and, 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 but again, right. What's the exit strategy? How is that loan going to be uh, going to get paid? And honestly, it's very important to realize uh, the situation that you might be in right now, because um, just like you said in the beginning of this call, right. Don't sell or buy, don't buy or sell if uh, um, it's not a necessity, right? So maybe uh, you can take a private mortgage to weather out this eight, nine months, right? And then after eight, nine months, you're going to be listing that house regardless, right? Mm -hmm. And you'll be able to sell it and maybe, uh, maybe uh, sell it for more money. Uh, you know, I had a, um, uh, I had a um, uh, transaction that I recently did. Uh, where, uh, you know, the client, uh, she, she, she unfortunately did not have any income. She was on retirement income. Uh, but her, um, um, her daughter uh, was actually a real estate agent. She had just become a real estate agent very recently. Uh, she'd only, she, she'd, she'd already done, I think, uh, two or three uh, transactions. And, uh, but there was no T4A available, right? So what we did was we, we, we did a private mortgage for them for, uh, I think it was a seven, eight months term. Uh, the whole game plan was in um, uh, next year, she's going to have her T4As. We're going to put her on the application and take that same deal to Equitable Bank, right? So it, it's, it's very important to have some sort of um, uh, exit strategy with private financing. Uh, but yes, the money is available. Uh, interest rates are still not bad from a private standpoint. You know, you're getting it at uh, six, 7%, sometimes even lower depending on loan to value. So if, um, you know, you, you own a home outright, we're only giving you, let's say, 50% loan to value. Yeah, 
you're looking at rates in the low fives. That's what some you know institutional lenders charge. So it's right. it's not a bad idea, and 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 qualification is very easy. Uh, but again, case by case yeah, basis. That's it. That's all you need to qualify, really. You need, right? you, yeah, you need a home. That's it. But you've got to be careful with that, right? And there's a lot of companies that you know. Um, uh, I don't want to say take advantage, but there's a lot of uneducated clients that will look into opportunities like this because it's quick. It's really easy. It's like credit card debt, right? And even with credit card debt, you shouldn't start amassing it without an exit strategy because what you owe at the beginning of the year is the exact same amount you owe at the end of the year, even after making your 12 payments. Um, and so I think that, that you're absolutely right. And, and why I wanted to raise all of this is so that the listeners understand and appreciate the fact that, yes, it's an opportunity. If you've got $100,000 in credit card debt right now that you're paying 19% interest on, then maybe the refinance on a private, if you can't qualify for a major financial institution, makes sense because it'll half your payments, yep. right? Um, if you look at the lender fees and the legal fees and what you incur, you're still going to save money on a month-over-month -month basis. You've just got to run the numbers and make sure that it makes sense. But ultimately, you've got to have an actionable exit plan whereby you either refinance it with a major financial institution and take advantage of the great rates that we have right now. And, 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 and potentially lock into one of those and pay out a loan like this, um, or you're going to have to sell. Uh, or it's just the spiral effect where you keep refinancing and refinancing until you've eaten out all the equity just to pay off these loans. Because unfortunately, um, you know, with any, any sort of mortgage, quite frankly, I think people don't realize this, is that banks will accommodate, yes, and it's not always on a case-by-case -case basis, but if a lender says your loan is due, and that's the end of our contract, your loan is due. That's the end of it, right? Which means that they have actionable legal recourse if you don't pay off the mortgage. And so if you end up in a situation where after a consultation, that's your only option, in my opinion, and again, you're gonna qualify your individual situation, you need to make sure that you've got the exit strategy in place and don't look at this like, okay, it's a quick fix. It's a Band-Aid, yes, but you've gotta scab that scar quickly and make sure that it doesn't open up in the long run and take you and your family to a point where you're actually going to suffer uh, quite significantly if it doesn't work, uh, if it hasn't been properly created, right? Because um, I know a lot of people, you know, especially with the high down payments, you know, for whatever reason, they can't get financing with a major financial institution. Some crazy thing happens. They'll revert to a private loan. And, 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 and the, you know, for the sake of closing the deal and not being found in breach of contract, they will look for a loan to, to, to make that deal happen. But there's always the exit strategy and it's always been that hey it's going to be an open loan for six months and within the first three months of that we looking at your tds your, TDS, your credit your your down payment and everything else yes we have an exit strategy we're going to refinance the property with a major financial institution and you're going to be out of this this is only a means to an inevitable end where you come out on top yeah no absolutely i mean you know we've used uh we've used uh, private financing to kind of bail out those uh, last minute, you know, deals that have uh, gone south. Uh, we've done that for, for, for a very, very long time. Um, and, and, and usually, the, you know, the best part is that uh, it, it gives you the time to, uh, you know, to coach your clients and get them where they need to be in order to qualify at, a, you know, A lender or a B lender, whatever, whatever the situation is, right? Uh, so yeah, you could buy some time using private financing, uh, but again, right, uh, with, with financing, it is such a, um, uh, personal, uh, such a personal thing that everyone's case is different, right? It, it, there's no two clients that are going to be alike, uh, but one thing is for sure, if you have, uh, if, you have if you're burdened with any sort of debt uh, or you're having a hard time making your payments, uh, you have to look at your equity in your house. Uh, you have to speak to a realtor, a mortgage broker, a banker uh, to figure out if there's, uh, if there's any way that we can leverage that equity, pay it out, uh, increase your cash flow, and really just improve your overall financial picture. Right? Absolutely. That's, that's, that's exactly what it is. So, Omer, I really appreciate you taking the time um, and, and addressing some of the questions that we've had at the office. I know it's going to make a big difference, especially with the listeners. Um, cause these have been very consistent questions. And I think we, we got a lot of those, uh, answers that we were looking for today. Uh, if somebody needs to reach out to you, how do they get a hold of you? 
Uh, you know what, uh, Ricky, when you put up this video, I'm sure you're going to link it uh, with my information. Uh, I'll send you an email uh, as well. Well, you, you have my email address, but yeah, you can call me 647-969-8094. Uh, you can go to our website, 6.ca, that's uh, uh, 6ix.ca. Uh, and really, it's not very hard to find us. You know, it's a Six Mortgage Group. We're all over Facebook, Instagram, everywhere. Uh, you should be able to find us pretty easily. My name is Omer. I'm the managing partner at Six Mortgage Group. Uh, yeah, reach out to us anytime. And, uh, you know, this is going out to your team. Uh, I think I mentioned last time I was at your office. Uh, we love to partner up. So um, uh, if uh, any of your realtors, uh, yes, if you, know, if, if you refer us business, uh, we do have referral fees and stuff like that. But more importantly than that, we love to partner up with events. Uh, we love to partner up with any kind of, uh, any kind of value proposition that you may have for your clients. You know, some people do uh, client appreciation events. Some people do, uh, you know, uh, shows or whatever it is, right? If you guys are doing that, give us a call. Why are you paying, you know, the, the whole thing out of your own pocket? Uh, let us sponsor half of it. You know, we're not going to uh, put our boards and pictures up there. Uh, it's going to be your event. Uh, but you know, that's just partnership that we, um, we provide so uh so talk to us about that we're always open we love doing events uh with our uh, with our realtor partners uh and um you know we love uh, uh featuring our agents on our uh, uh on our social media as well so uh if anybody's interested just let us know we love it all right thank you so much Omer. we'll talk thank to you, you soon absolutely cheers stay thank safe you. take care